speedometer. All right. Checking on the speedometer. Let's uh, begin. So we're still today, we're just doing basically expected values. That's it. We're just continuing. Uh, here's the last thing we proved last time. We'll re-go over the proof of this real quick just to get our feet wet again, and then we'll continue. So what are we proving here? We're, well, maybe let's... Let's just start from the beginning, read in our heads into everything. So first off, this whole section is about what? Expected value. Or sorry, the whole chapter is about what? Probability. Probability and statistics. And what is the mathematical construct, the mathematical model that we've been using throughout this whole section? A sample space. A sample space. What's a sample space? It's literally like the S and the P. The S and the P, so it's an ordered pair. We usually use S and P, where S is what and P is what? P is a probability of S. P is a probability function. Let's start by saying what S is, then we'll come back to P. S is just a set of sets. It's just a finite, non-empty set. Yeah. We call it the set of possible outcomes, right? Yeah. Now, P is a probability function. So what do I know about P right out the door? Positive S. So... P is a function from S to what? Uh, real numbers. R, real numbers. It assigns to everything in S some real number that we call its probability. Oh. What else do we know about P? P is less P than can't one. Be, yeah, P can't be more than one. Yeah, the sum. No, the sum is equal to one. The sum of everything in P is equal to one. The individual elements of P are between zero and one. Yes. They could be one. You could have P equal to something like this. Perfectly valid. Right? We get A with probability 0, we get B with probability 0, we get C with probability 1. Yeah. The sum of all those are 1, got more than one thing in there. Right? Yeah. Okay. And then we had a random variable. What's a random variable? If I have x as a random variable, what do we know about it? It's only a function on x. A function from s to the real numbers. s to anything. If it's a real random variable, then it's s to the real numbers. Oh, yeah. Any function that maps s is a random variable. Yes, a probability function counts as a random variable. It takes everything in S and assigns it something. In fact, a probability function is a real random variable, but it's a very specific one. So we've got S up here, we've got P, now we've got X, which is a, a random variable. In this case, it's a real random variable. Now, we love real random variables because we're able to do something with them. We're able to calculate what's called their expected value, right? And what is the expected value of x? It's equal to the sum for all little s and big s of x at that number times the probability of that number. Mm -hmm. That all make sense? Yeah. And that gets us right back up to where we're ready to take off. So what we're saying here, what we're gonna prove now, is if I have two real random variables, x and y, then the expected value of their sum is equal to the sum of their expected values. With me? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so let's prove this real quick. So, proof, we're proving that. So, one, let's see, what is the expected value of x plus y? By definition, that is the sum for all little s and big s of x of s plus y of s, all times p of s. It's what you get when you plug in s to that function times the probability of getting that s. Right? And then this is equal to, I'm going to distribute the p of s. Now, every time I have little s and big s, I'm going to stop writing that and I'm just going to write the sum. So this is equal to the sum of, sorry, of x of s times p of s 
plus, just distributing that through, y of x times p of s. And we're summing all these up, right? Mm -hmm. And this is equal to, if I'm summing up a bunch of sums, I can split that into two separate sums if I want, right? So, so the x of x times p of x plus the sum. Perfect. Plus the sum of y of s times p of s, which is exactly the definition of the expected value of x plus the expected value of y. Follow that? Yeah. Okay. So that's the first one. Now, rolling two fair dice. Okay. So an example using this. So imagine that we didn't already know the expected value of rolling two fair dice, but we do know it. If I take two six-sided fair dice and I roll, what's the expected value? Seven. Seven, right? Remember that? Mm -hmm. Pretty common. What was it for one die? 3.5. 3.5. So if I say x, well, I don't even need to write this out. You'll just see it. So then the expected value of rolling both dies is equal to the expected value on the first die plus the expected value on the second die, right? Yeah. And we know the expected value on one die, 3.5. We know the expected value on the other die, 3.5. Therefore, the expected value on two die is 7. What if I roll three dice? What's the expected value? 10.5. What if I rolled 100 dice? What's the expected value? 300. 350. 300.50. Yeah. <laughs> 350. Is anyone getting lost in how we're doing this? Does anyone feel like we're doing something magical? Okay. So, now you can calculate the expected values for as many dice as you want. Easy as pie, right? So, now let's prove the next thing that we want to prove. Oh, wow. Okay. This one's kind of trivial. But see here, maybe you specify what we're saying. We're saying the expected value of a constant times our expectation, our uh, random variable, is equal to a constant times the expected value of that random variable. So let's prove that one. So the expected value of a constant times x is equal to the sum for all little s and big s of x. of c times x of s times p of s, just using the definition of expected value, right? Now we factor the c out of the sum, so that's equal to c times the sum of x of s times p of s, which is exactly equal to c times the expected value of x. Anything weird there? How would you factor out the C? Yeah, they, they this is a sum of a bunch of terms. So imagine I have oh, C yeah. times X plus C yeah. times Y plus C times Z plus C times, doesn't matter what you put next, square. So when I have that sum, I can factor the C out of the sum, and it's just C times X plus Y plus Z plus square. Right. Mm -hmm. So factoring the C out of the sum. Right. Because every term has C. Any other questions? Pretty straightforward? Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. So now uh, we'll prove linearity, which is this one. So A and B here are constants. So the expected value of a constant times x plus a constant times y is equal to a constant times the expected value of x plus a constant times the expected value of y. Now this is just using this and this together. Right. So maybe we won't even bother writing that. Right? You can start with this. You can turn this into two things that look like this, and then pull the constants out, which gives you this. Yep. Easy. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay. So now multiplying expected values. And obviously, when we multiply expected values, we're going to get the expected value of x times y is equal to the expected value of x times the expected value of y, right? So let's make that appeal to our intuition first with an example. So we have a fair coin and it's tossed twice. And it's going to come up heads or tails. 
x sub h, we've used this before, probably should have re-specified what it is, is the number of times a heads comes up, and x sub t is the number of times a tails comes up. So, all my possible outcomes, we have four possible outcomes. I can have h, 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 t, t, h, t, t. So that's what's in s. The probability of each outcome is 1 fourth. I have four outcomes. So the probability of each one is 1 fourth. So what is the expected number of times I'll flip a heads? One. One. You expect me to get a heads once. Now she's just using her intuition, right? But you can do exactly what she did and see that you still get one. We get a zero. How often? How many ways do I get zero heads? One fourth. Uh, one, fourth. one fourth. Plus, how many ways do I get one heads? One What's the probability I get one heads? I mean, that's one half. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I should be saying probability, not how many. Plus, the probability that I get two heads. One fourth. So we have zero plus a half plus a half is one. Just like your intuition automatically tells you, you flip a coin twice, you expect to see heads once. Make sense? And the expected value of the number tells you, so it's going to be the exact same math, still one. Okay. So then the expected value of the number of heads times the number of tails is one. One, right? The expected value of heads is 1. The expected value of tails is 1. Oh. So the expected value of their product is 1. But let's write it out. So, let's see. We get a 0 here when x of h is 0 or x of t is 0. And we get a 1 when they're both 1. Right? Yeah. This is a product. Oh, yeah. It's x of h times x of t. So if we get... We'll go over all the different scenarios. If we get zero heads and two tails, what's this? Zero. Zero. If we get one heads and one tails, what's this? One. And if we get zero heads and two tails, what's this? Zero. Zero. So what's the probability that we get a zero out of this sink? One fourth. Two fourths. Two fourths or one half, right? We get heads, heads, or tails, tails. Plus, and then what's the probability we get one? One fourth. One half. Yeah. Heads, tails, or tails, heads? Mm -hmm. There's four possible oh. outcomes. Yes. Heads, heads, and tails, tails give us this. Heads, tails, or tails, heads give us this, which is equal to one half, which is one times one. Right? No! What? <laughs> yeah, okay. This is not equal to 1. It's equal to 1 half. You cannot just multiply these together. That doesn't work. Multiply what together? So this is not equal to 1, which is equal to the expected value of x of h times the expected value of x of t. Oh. So this and this are not the same thing. That's an h, not a for all. But, yeah. Uh, the plus was nice. What's wrong with multiply? Obviously, it doesn't always work. Right? How is it one half? Because a zero one half doesn't count, right? What well, zero times one half? Zero. So it counts to zero. Okay, then that xh is not one. Because it's one half plus one fourth. This is multiplying together our number of heads times our number of tails. Same. Same and up. H. How is that one? Because you have two. Oh, it's plus. No, I don't get it. Okay. This is the number of heads. Okay. How many? What's the probability that I don't have any heads? One fourth. One fourth. Okay. What's the probability that I have one heads? One fourth. I can have a heads and a tails, or a tails and a heads. That's two of my four possible outcomes. Okay. What's the probability that I have two heads? One fourth. One fourth. But if the zero times one fourth doesn't count, then I bet you have two times. What's one, one times a half? A half. What's two times a fourth? A half. A half. What's a half? 
half plus a half. Okay, okay. A big old hole. I get it now. I get it. All right. So we understand that the expected value of x of h is 1. The expected value of x of t is 1. So the expected value, so the product of the expected values is 1. But the expected value of the products is not 1. It's 1 half. So you can't just use this conversion. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So now when can we use this conversion? We can use this conversion when x and t, or when our two random variables, x and y, are independent. If they're independent, then this formula works. If they're not independent, then this formula doesn't work. Notice that these two are not independent variables. If I tell you how many heads there were, that gives you a lot of information about how many tails there can be, right? So these are not independent random variables. Knowing information about one gives us information about the other. However, if we were to create random variables where one random variable was what you got in the first toss and the other random variable was what you got in the second toss, then this would work. Because then those are completely independent. Knowing what I got in the first toss tells me nothing about what I got in the second toss yeah. and vice versa. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So now we're actually going to Prove it. Prove it right here. Okay, this is a proof, and then this thing down here is. No, no. One more line down. One more line down, thank you. And then there's my example. Okay, there we go. I don't know why I wasn't seeing that in my head. Alright, so let's prove this. This is the case when x and y are random variables. So one. Independent. Thank you. Let x, y be independent. What am I writing? Independent. Okay. Two. Independent real random variables on some sample space, SP. We don't care about all that, right? So, two. Then, the expected value of x times expected value of x times y is equal to what? It's equal to the sum for all little s and big s of x sub s times y sub s times the probability of that thing coming up. Good so far? Okay. So now, this is equal to, am I going to do this probability of A for all real numbers A? Uh, 20 times 6 million X, X, Rather than X, playing X. with it, let's just see how the author starts it so I don't actually take down a bad hat. Because those are functions. Oh, that's how he just starts it out. Okay, so, and this is also equal to the sum for all A in the real numbers. Hmm. Oh, he starts us with a Z. calculating an expected value, we said another way that we can calculate the expected value of x, uh, that is equal to the sum for all a in the real numbers of a times the probability that x is equal to a. You remember that theorem? Yeah. You remember what that's saying? Okay, so let's go over what it's saying. Uh, let, let's
let's write this equation two different ways so that you can kind of remember the leaps that we went through. Oops, little s in s of x of s times the probability of that s coming up. So this is normally how we define this thing, and we show that this and this are the same thing, right? Now here's intuitively how to see it. When I plug in an s here, then this spits out a real number, right? Yeah. So it might spit out a 1, a 1, a 2, and then a 4. So notice it spit out a 1 twice, and then a 2 once and a 4 once. Mm -hmm. And we'll say it does this one half the time, this one half the time, or 1 fourth, 1 fourth, 1 fourth, 1 fourth. So they all come out 1 fourth the time, right? Mm -hmm. So if we do that here, then we get 1 times a fourth plus 1 times a fourth plus 2 times a fourth plus 4 times a fourth, if we expanded it out this way, right? Mm -hmm. This one's saying we're going to look at all the numbers that it gives us, 1 times the probability of a 1 coming up. What's the probability of a 1 coming up? One half. one half. Plus 2 times the probability of that coming up, 1 fourth. Plus 3 times the probability of that coming up, er, or four. 4 times the probability of that coming up, 1 fourth. So it just groups our sums together. So if we did it this way, we would have written it as 1 times a fourth plus 1 times a fourth plus 2 times a fourth plus 4 times a fourth. This way saying, let's just group all our terms together that had the same number here. That gave us, this, where x of s gave us the same value. So when we go from this formula to this formula, all it did was group these two together into that term. So this is grouping each one together. It's doing a, x of s fitting out an a times the probability of that happening instead of taking it one at a time and adding them all up. So you just reorder the sum. That's what the whole group is doing, just shifting around the sum making the terms group together. Okay, so feel like you're comfortable with this now? Yep. Okay. So, the way that the author starts this, let x, y be independent, and then let z equal x times y. So now we're going to show that the expected value of z is equal to the expected value of x times the expected value of y. Same thing. Okay. So then, the expected value of z is equal to the sum for all a in r of a times the probability that z is equal to a, right? Mm -hmm. Now this is also equal to, maybe we'll just keep expanding it out as we go, this is also equal to, um, the sum for all B and C in R. Let me uh, start this chord to the left. This is also the sum for all B, C in R such that A is equal to B times C. Of, does he such two full moon in one go? Oh, that's how it makes it more clear. Yeah, that's a good idea. So we're going to play with this internal thing for a second. And then come back up to the full sum. So what is the probability that z is equal to a? So the probability that z is equal to a is equal to the sum for all b, c, and r such that b times c is equal to a of the probability that x is equal to a and y is equal to b. So z is equal to a exactly when x and y are equal to things such that, that should not be an a, sorry. This is a b and a c. Okay, so z is equal to a exactly when x and y are equal to numbers whose product gives us a, right? Z is the product of those two things. When is z a? 
When does Z spit out the number A? When the product of X and Y spits out the number A. So the probability that Z is equal to A is exactly the probability that X and Y are equal to numbers whose product is A. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So now we're going to make this substitution into here. Let me look first before I do it so I don't keep backtracking and confusing you more. Okay. Yeah. That's exactly where it goes. So fun. So then the expected value of z is equal to the sum. So now we're substituting this thing right there. So we still have the sum for all a and r of a times the sum for all b, c in R such that B times C is equal to A of the probability. So I'm just rewriting this thing right here. But now, since I know that X and Y are independent, the probability that X is equal to B and Y is equal to C is exactly equal to the probability that X is equal to B times the probability that Y is equal to C. That's what it meant for two probabilities to be independent. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. The probability that the first flip of my coin is heads oh, and right. that the second flip of my coin is tails is the probability that my first hip flip is heads times the probability that my second flip is tails. We just said the same thing because those are independent variables, independent events. Make sense? So since I know this is independent, that can be substituted that way. Right? Anything weird? Okay. So now, that's just equal to the sum over all the real numbers B, C, and R, such that B, C is equal to A of B, C times well, do we want to do that all in one go? Shit, let's see what he does first. Oh, he puts the A back in and then makes that substitution. Okay, so next I'm going to distribute the A to every term in this sum. You follow that? So we have a sum of A's times a sum. So big picture what we have, we have A times plusing things inside of here, plus A times summing things inside of here, plus A times plusing things inside of here, some number of times. So we have a sum, an outer sum, of A's times inner sums. That's what that's saying right there. You with me? Yeah. <laughs> A lot of sigma notation, I know. I don't expect you to be able to reproduce this proof. The only reason I'm forcing you to go through this is to try and get you more comfortable with sigma notation for the sake of future math classes that you're all for sure going to do. Right? So this is the sum for all A and R of the sums for all this thing again. Let me put my A and R there and need more room. Move my sigma out. B, C, and R such that B times C is equal to A. But now I'm moving the A inside of there. You follow that? Because that is A. B times C is A. So we move the A inside the sums, and we rewrote it as B times C. But don't you have to do it to the whole thing? We did. B times C is being applied to this whole thing. Because this is a product. 
So now every term in this sum, we just gave it an A. We did A times what was in there before. That make sense? Now we have a sum of sums. We don't need to have a group that way. We can just sum up over our B's and C's. Right? Having a sum of sums is completely redundant. Because we're summing up basically one sum now. Well, no we're not. We're picking A and then we sum up where it's equal to A. But either way, we could just express that now as the sums of B, C's in R. B times C times the product of X equal to B times the product of Y equal to C. Good? And now, we can regroup this. I want my B times that, my C times that. Okay, that's how I can do it. Okay, so we're going to, once again, regroup the terms. So we're going to take each B in R, and then we're going to sum over each C in R. So pick a B, then pick all the C's that go with that B and add those ones up first. And then pick your next B and all the C's that go with that B and add those up next. And then pick your next B and all the C's that go with that one and add those up next. So we're just changing the order that we add these. Still B times C times the probability that X is equal to B times the probability that Y is equal to C. And now this is equal to, I think we're safe to pull it out. Finally, so now this is the sum for all B and R of B times the probability that X is equal to B all times the sum for C in R that times C times the probability that Y is equal to C. So in each one of these terms, once we picked a B, the same B and probability of X equaling B was being applied to everything in the inner sum. So once my B's chosen in my outer sum, each of my inner sums, this inner sum is using that same B over and over again until we finish our inner sum. And we pick our next B and do the inner sum again. And we pick our next B and do the inner sum again, right? So once we pick a B, the inner sum uses that same B and that same probability of X equal to B over and over again, so we can factor that out of the inner sum. Okay. And now we can write that as the product, which is unintuitive until you think about it for a second. So this is the probability that B is equal to R of B times the probability that X is equal to B. And now we have this sum times, and now this is no longer an inner sum. Maybe use square brackets. So now we have that sum times this sum. And that, if you've been keeping up with the proof so far, should be a confusing step. Because, how can I make this make intuitive sense now? Uh, When we look at it up here, I'm just going to use, up here we basically had B1, when we picked a particular B, we had B1 times our different C's, C1 plus C2, and then we had plus our next B that we chose, B2 times C1 plus C2. And now, when we have it written this way, we have B1 being applied to everything, and we have B2 being applied to everything. So that would be the exact same thing as B1 plus B2 times C1 plus C2. You see how you can do that factoring going from here to here? 
basically factor this sum out of both the terms. Maybe that's the right way to say it. So here I've got a big product. We're taking each term here, and we're always multiplying it by this sum. So factor that sum out of this whole sum, and you're left with a product of sums. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> OK. And now that is exactly the expected value of x times the expected value of y. Writing it the same way we wrote up here. Notice how we start out with the expected value of z. It's the sum over all the real numbers of a times the probability that that thing gives you a. Here we have it's the sum over all real numbers of b times the probability that that thing gives you b times the sum over all real numbers of c times the probability that that thing gives you c. See all that? All right. Nice dense proof. Read that long enough. If you can go through this proof and understand it, you'll be a pro with sigma. Never have to worry about it again. Okay. So now let's move on to whatever this is saying. This one. Our next example. All right, so let S be the numbers 1 through 10. We're going to say each one's equally likely. And we're going to let x be the, random the real random variable given by this table. So when you give it 1, it spits out 1. When you give it 2, it spits out 1. When you give it 3, it spits out 1. When you give it 4, it spits out 1. When you give it 5, it spits out 2. You understand how it works? OK. So what the author is trying to demonstrate here is that you can use expected value to find center of mass. So if I were to put 1 kilogram, one thing of mass at this position, Oh, sorry. If I put my first thing of mass at 1, my second thing of mass at 1, my third thing of mass at 1, my fourth thing of mass at 1, my fifth thing of mass at 2, I'm saying this wrong still. No, I'm not. No, you can't. Right. My fifth thing of mass at 2, my sixth thing of mass at 2, my seventh at 8, my eighth at 8, my ninth at 8, and my tenth at 8. And we like marking positions on kind of like a teeter totter. The question is, so here's like a teeter-totter. The question is, where do I need to put my triangle like that to hold the teeter-totter up so it holds all these weights perfectly? So let me start drawing in these weights and maybe that'll make more sense. So I'm going to put my first one at 1, so we put a weight of 1 at 1. My second one at 1, so we stack down on top of it. My third one at 1. My fourth one at 1. My fifth one goes at 2. My sixth one goes at 2. My seventh one goes at 8. My eighth one goes at 8. My ninth one goes at 8, and my tenth one goes at 8. So we've got this board. Pretend this board is completely weightless compared to these massive rocks or whatever. So we've got them on a teeter-totter. The question is, where would I have to put my little triangle thing so I, I would hold it up completely balanced? At 4. At 4? How'd you get at 4? The expected value gives us where to put it. So we'll just calculate the expected value of this thing. Uh, so we do 1 times, what's the probability that we get 1? 1 tenths. What? 4 tenths. Oh, 4 tenths. Uh, if we want to keep it in tenths. 4 tenths plus, what's the probability of I get a 2? 2 tenths. 2 tenths. Plus the probability that I get a 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7 is all zero, so I won't bother writing those terms. Plus, what's the probability that I get an 8? 4 tenths. 4 tenths. So that's equal to, add it all up, how many tenths do we get? Let's just count our tenths real quick, maybe that'll be easier. We've got, oh, everything was even. We should have written these in terms of this. Doesn't matter. So we've got 4 plus 4 is 8, plus 32 is 40. 4 over 10 is 4. So you put it at 4. Huh? I, I added those. Did you not follow the adding? Because it turned out to be really simple. We had 4 in the numerator here. What did we get in the numerator over here? So here we have 4 tenths, right? How many tenths do we have over here? 2 tenths. But we have 2 tenths twice. Oh. So how many tenths do we have? 4. 4 tenths. How many tenths do we have here? 
32. 32. So I have 4 here, 4 here, and 32 here for a total of? 40. 40 tenths. What's 40 tenths? 4. 4. See? You could have had that just as fast as me. Okay. So that takes care of that. That was kind of just a side note that you want to point out of interest. Now we're going to move on to variance. And you probably came across that work on your homework. Hopefully I gave you at least one problem with variance. I didn't give you a single problem with variance. I don't think you did. Oh my goodness. I know way too much. <laughs> Alright, we'll go over variance anyways, even though you guys will probably check out now. <laughs> Let's look at three different types of data based on random variables. So let's say I've got this random variable, and it spits out 2 50% of the time, and it spits out negative 2 50% of the time. Yeah. You with me? Yeah. What's the expected value of x? It's the sum of um, all the x values. What do I, on average, expect x to give me? There's no average. Just look at it. Zero. Zero. How is this throwing you guys off? How do you do that? You can't know. 2 times 0. 0.5 plus negative 2 times 0. 0.5, 0. Right. Or, what's the center of those things? If I put half my weight at 2 and half my weight at negative 2, where's the middle? 0. How can the expected value be 0 if 50% of the time you get 2 and 50% of the time you get negative 2? Okay. You and I are playing a game where we flip a coin. Yes. Anytime you flip a heads, I give you $2. So you get 2. Anytime you flip the tails, you give me $2, so you lose 2. So half the time you get $2, half the time you lose $2. On average, how much money do you expect to make? Zero. Nothing. Okay. Zero. That help? Yeah. Okay. So here's one data set, and it's expected by zero. Let's look at this other data set. That's like 99.8% of the time, you get a zero, but ever so slightly every now and then, you get a 10 or a negative 10. You with me on that one? Mm -hmm. What's the expected value? Zero. Zero. Now let's look at another data set. Another data set, one third of the time you get negative five, one third of the time you get zero, one third of the time you get five. Make sense? Mm -hmm. What's the expected value of that? Zero. zero. So all these are data points, or all these are sets of data that on average give you a zero. Mm -hmm. But they're very different types of data sets. They're very different. And one of the things that we might say is how, a, a natural question we might want to know about our data is how spread out is our data? So which of those does it seem is the most spread out? Why? Why is the most spread out? So you might be tempted to say why is the most spread out because it goes all the way from 10 to negative 10. But notice it hardly ever spits out a 10 or negative 10. Right? If you were to Plot this thing. Ooh, let me move my camera. Z is the most spread out? Yeah. Uh, that'll be fine. Oh, you mean the desk? Here, I'll just move it over to the desk. Jacket that is. Okay, I just gotta remember not to go. Let's see. One, two, three. We can close this one. We type that real quick and make sure. Is that right? Good. Okay. So just remember not to go too far that way. Okay, so now I'm over here, so don't mess with that. All right. Uh, so let's think about how this data looks. Let's picture it for a second. So let's first look at x. x, we have 2 here. We have negative 2 here, right? And the data looks like we get 2's a decent amount of time, and we get negative 2 the same amount of time. So our data looks kind of like that, right? If we look at uh, y, y looks something like this. 
we get I don't have time to write as many points here as we need to to make me justified in putting a point here and putting a point here, but I need a lot more of those, all centered at zero. Sorry, I have that kind of spread out, but they're all centered at zero. Just an absurd amount, like it's just a, like that. <laughs> and then we got a little dot here and there every now and then. And then the other one, we have zero, five, and minus five. And that one's pretty evenly distributed between those three, right? So looking at this data intuitively, what's the least spread out data? Why? This one's the least spread out. And what's the most spread out? Z. Uh, it's kind of, uh, is it Z or is it X? You know, Z still has one third of its data right smack center, but X doesn't go as far away. Hard to tell, but for sure not Y, even though that has the most extreme points, right? Yeah. Okay. Are you We're going to calculate it. So we need a, we're, the whole point of variance is trying to come up with a way of calculating exactly which one's the most spread out. So we don't need to sit here and argue about which one feels the most spread out to me, right? Let's come up with a right answer and a wrong answer. Let's come up with a way to calculate it, and then we'll say right answer versus wrong answer. All right, so which is the most spread out? Now note, from here on out, I'm going to start using this mu symbol for the expected value of x. Because we have to write it so much, this makes the notation less confusing for you. Because the expected value of x, once I pick x, then the expected value of x is always just a number. So if x is rolling one die, the expected value is just 3.5. It's always 3.5. Right? So it's just going to be a constant. Once you pick your random variable, its expected value is just a constant. It doesn't change. Make sense? So we're going to use means to represent that. Now, if we want to calculate how spread out this data is, how might we do that? A natural way to do it might be, let's just look at how far the data is from its expected value and multiply it by the probability that it ends up that far away. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Say that one more time. So we look at a data point yeah. and we say, We'll calculate the distance by looking at how far the data is from the expected value, and that will be a measure of how spread out it is. So I'll just add up, so for example, we know the expected value here is zero, so I'll just add up that distance right there, and that distance right there, for each data point, and that will give me a feel for how spread out the data is. So the way that we might do this, here's what I have it right now. For each data point, Calculate its distance from the expected value, the center of mass, and multiply it by the probability that we actually get that point, right? Yeah. Because if we're looking at this data set right here, I only get this distance one third of the time, I only get this distance one third of the time, and then I get a distance of zero one third of the time. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, we might want it to be this sum, but let's see what exactly this is. If we distribute the P, the probability of S, into the scene, then we get this minus this. You follow the algebra up to here? Yeah. Okay. So now, we just have this sum minus this sum. So I'm just putting it into two separate sums. Right. You follow that? Okay. What is this sum? Uh, the mu. Yeah, it's the expected value of X. Yeah. I didn't know if I could go straight to mu, I thought I might lose you. But it's the expected value of x, and then we can pull the mu out of that sum. So we have the mu that we factor out this sum. You okay with rewriting this sum this way since mu is just a constant? Mm -hmm. Now what is the number we get when we sum up all our probabilities? One. One. So this is just the expected value of x minus mu times one. Or the expected value of x minus the expected value of x. Zero. Ah, uh, well, shoot. That's so kind of useless. Zero. Great. So you can't do that? Wait, wouldn't it be one? So you can't do that, no. Because the expected value minus the expected the value. The expected value of x and mu are the same thing. So I have mu minus mu. Well, uh, oh, this is not your one. 
Okay. Zero times one is zero. How many is one mu? That's just mu. I just wrote the times one there to make you realize that this okay. function collapsed into a one. Okay. <laughs> okay. Except Order of operations. You have to do the times one to the mu before you go minusing things. Uh, right? Yeah, you need to go study the axioms of arithmetic. Learn how to do your basic operations. Okay. So that didn't work, right? If we use this for any of these, then we always get, oh, it's spread out, this is zero. How does that help? Doesn't. It doesn't. And why are we getting that it's spread out, this is zero? Because for every positive, I wrote my negatives, oh, no, I didn't. For every time we get a positive number, we get the exact same negative number, and when we add those up, they're gonna be zero. However far to the right, we go from our expected value, we're going to go the same far to the left of our expected value, and it's always just going to add up to zero. For these examples, right? No, always. This did not presuppose anything. However far you go to the right of your expected value, it doesn't matter if our expected value would have been at 100, and this would have been negative 110, and this would have been 110. Doesn't matter. What if those were different numbers, though? It doesn't matter. The expected value is always going to be right smack in the middle of all of them. It's going to have just as much weighted stuff on its right as it's going to have on oh, its yeah. left. Okay. It's going to perfectly cancel out. It perfectly says all the things over here cancel out with all the things over there. Right. So it's always going to cancel out like that. And so this doesn't work. Shoot. Two. So we need a way to make sure that this difference here is always a positive number. And then when we added it up, it would give us some notion of distance, right? So how can I make sure that this is always a positive number? One way to do it is to just square the value, right? Because when you square it, you always get a positive number. We could have also done the absolute value. There's a lot of different tips and tricks, or there's a lot of ways that we could have done this. The one that's chosen for statistical analysis is to square it. When you square it, this is exactly what we mean by the variance. Does that make sense? So, let's get the exact definition now. Let x be a real random variable, and let mu be the expected value of x. Then the variance of x is, we write it this way, var of x is equal to the expected value of x minus mu squared. That's exactly what this is. Because you miss your probability. When you take the expected value, you plug s into the thing here times oh, the yeah. probability of that s. Yeah, that's right. So when I expand this out, I would expand it out exactly into that. Any other questions? Okay, so now let's do it. Let's calculate the variance of each of those things and see how good our intuition was, or see how well it matches up with our intuition. So, let's see, for this one, it's going to be the sum, we won't bother writing out the sum, but we need to do, uh, notice that our mu in all those cases was what? Zero. zero. So we have x minus mu squared, or x minus zero squared, or just x squared. Mm -hmm. So we just need to calculate the expected value of x squared. Why did I put e of x? Sorry. Oh, maybe I was thinking we'll start by checking. No, we already know. I don't know why I put that there. I'm trying to come up with something that makes sense. Can't think of anything. We're coming up with the variance. So let's start with the variance of x. The variance of x is equal to what? We've got. 2 squared 50% of the time plus negative 2 squared 50% of the time, right? Mm -hmm. Notice it should be 2 minus 0 squared and then negative 2 minus 0 squared, but since it's 0, we don't have to worry about that. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Yeah. And so our variance here is 4. 4! Yeah. Obviously, look at that thing. That's 4 spread out if I've ever seen it. 
You can just count it. <laughs> can you? Let's see. Then what's the spread outness of z? Is it 10? No. <laughs> <laughs> we got a yes? Mm -hmm. All right, first we're going to do the spread outness of y. What's the spread outness of y then? 20? Oh. Right? Yeah. Yeah, the spread outness of y is 20. Let's see. It's probably like 20 when you divide it by something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can probably take 20 and divide it by a number that gives you the number that it actually is. In fact, you can for sure do that. <laughs> because if you're looking for, if it's y, and you said 20 divided by something gives us that y, once I know the y, how do I get the x? Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> Since there's not a real number there, you're going to get confused that one was supposed to be a number and one was a variable. Never mind. Uh, anyway, variance of y. What's the variance of y? So we get 10, 10 squared, squared times, times 1 over 100, or 1 over 1,000. 1 over 1,000, or we'll just say, uh, are you okay if we just start with point zero zero one instead of a 0 0.001? Zero zero and then we have plus zero, zero, zero times 0.998, but that's just zero, so we'll skip that one, plus negative 10 squared times 0 0.001. Everyone follow that? Yes. Which is equal to what? 0 0.2. 0 0.2. What in the slot did you do that? Multiply, multiply by 100, shifts the decimal point. Right. Twice. If I have 100 times 1,000th, then that's a tenth. Mm -hmm. 100 times 1,000th is okay. a tenth. Two yeah. tenths. Or 0. Point, we'll put a zero there. 0. All right, yeah, so 10 spread out. Or at least 20 divided by 100 spread out. Hey, hey there was a number. What are the odds? <laughs> All right. Uh, variance. variance of z now is equal to? Negative 5 squared. We get, you want to start with that one? Okay. <laughs> Negative 5 <laughs> squared times? One third. One third. Plus five squared times. Which is what? What did you just do? Okay. Oh, sorry. Get all fancy on this, right? <laughs> okay. And what does that equal? Yeah, you do. Think about it. sense to you that a negative times a negative is a positive? Yes. Okay. So 25 thirds plus 25 thirds is 50 thirds. It and is. 50 thirds, if you want to represent that as decimal. as a decimal, is approximately what? What's 50 divided by 3? I was to figure out. 8. No. It's more than 10. It's less than 20. <laughs> Sanity. You can't 10. go past 12. You can't go past 12? If you can't go, oh. if it's hard for you to count up, count down. So you know that 3 times 20 is what? 60. 60. So you know 3 times 19 is what? 57. 57. 3 times 18 is what? 54. 54, then we would have done 51, then we would have done 48. What's the number associated with 48? 16. 16. So 16, and how many do we have remaining? 2. 2. 2 thirds is the same as 0.667, something like that. Yep. Roughly that. So notice, uh, this is by far the most spread out data. Z is by far the most spread out data. The other ones don't come close. And our thing might be a little, little misleading because we didn't write this to scale. So if we try to be write more to scale than this one, let's see. That's five, so that would have been three. One, two, three, four. Oh, one, two. I did that really wrong. Uh, let's see. We need to split. There's not an easy trick to do it, is there? Yeah. I just need to kind of like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, anyway, 
so two is roughly that far. So two would be more like this if we're running it to scale. So then this data looks like that. Right? And notice that since we're doing our distance squared, then doubling the distance should four times the variance. Right? So if we move this one twice as far and this one twice as far, then that should have four times the variance, which should have given us a 16 instead. Of a four. Does that make sense? What's your point? If I double this distance, it four times the variance. So data, if we oh. double the distance with our data, you four times the variance. You didn't double your variance. Okay, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So it shouldn't be too surprising to us that this is more than just double that. Yeah, it's even more than four times it. Well, and it also has some data in the middle, which changes things as well. So you can't just think about it simply from looking at this one. But we shouldn't be too surprised that it was even more than double. Well, that middle one didn't really matter to me. That middle matters a lot. Look at this one. Yeah, it doesn't matter. This one was 10, 0, and negative 10. And what was its variance? Point two. If we got rid of the middle of this, should we figure out its variance when we get rid of that? <laughs> the middle matters very, very much. Okay. So variance. And we calculate the variance of some things. Uh, I don't know. This seems like it's more complicated than just a simple single fair die is cost, by x being the number rolled, maybe we'll do it real quick. So, now we're talking about just rolling a die, one single die, six-sided die. We already know the expected value of the die. What's the expected value? 3.5. 3.5. Now let's calculate the variance of the die. Now what's the variance of the die? It's the same maybe write this out to help keep very clear in our head what we're calculating. That's going to be the expected value of x minus 3.5 or mu squared. That is the variance. Our variance is equal to the expected value of x minus the expected value of x or mu. That's why we don't put another e sub x in there and we use a mu instead. So you don't have an expected value inside of expected value. Mm -hmm. Does that make confusion? So we just want the expected value of this thing. Right? For a die. And what is this equal to? It's going to be 1 minus 3.5 squared times the probability of 1, 1 6, plus 2 minus 3.5 squared times the probability of 2 plus
can't use a calculator on your test, so be ready to work all this out by hand. And it's going to be easier to think that in terms of seven halves rather than 3.5, but it comes out to 35 over 12. So that's how spread out the data is. Right? Oh, this is almost three. It's barely less than three. If that was 36, it would be three. So, I don't know if you probably use the decimal approximation in here too. Yeah, 2.91, 2.92. Okay. All right. Uh, we've got one more theorem to prove, and then we're done. And this will give us an easier way to calculate the variance. The variance of x, we can also say, is just the expected value of x squared minus the expected value of x, or mu squared. That's what we're going to prove. So let's see. So the variance of x is equal to the sum of Looking at the definition here, oh, I'm kind of skipping from, I'll, I'll plug that in first. We'll, we'll keep it simple. So this is equal to the expected value of, uh, should have done square bracket, expected value of, oh no, x of s. No, x. Mine parentheses, there we go, that's what I was doing. Mu squared. Okay, geez. Right, now what's this equal to? This is equal to the sum of x sub s, uh, put parentheses here, maybe you put a bracket so we can keep track of our whole sum. This is equal to the sum, what are we summing up? Everything. The sum of x sub s minus mu squared times the probability of getting that s. Have I lost anyone so far? Have I lost you? Uh, are you good with going from here to here? What? Are you good with going from the variance yes. of x to this? Yes. Okay. So the expected value of this thing is the sum for all little s and big s mm -hmm. of what you get when you plug in s to that thing times the probability of getting s. Mm -hmm. So wow. it's what you get when you plug s into that thing times the probability of that s. Okay. okay. So now I'm going to I'm going to multiply this out and distribute my p of s. So this is equal to I'm not going to bother putting that stuff under the sum anymore. It's always that sum. So that's the sum of, multiplying this out, what do we get? We get x of s squared minus 2 mu x of s. Why, how did you get on your Plus mu squared. Oh shoot, I forgot to distribute my p of s. We'll just keep all that together and put my p of s on the outside. Anything confusing there? Am I losing you in the algebra explaining this out? No, I think I got it. A minus B squared is equal to A times A is A squared. We have A times uh, negative B, negative AB. We have negative B times A, or negative AB again, and then negative B times B is plus B squared. Combine those two, we get A squared B minus 2AB plus B squared. Negative. Yeah, I know that. Follow the algebra? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's all the algebra that we did going from this to this. Okay. Uh, now, distribute our P of S, I think. Uh, 
Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm also going to want to view these as separate sums. So we'll distribute our P of S, and I think I might want to view them each as separate sums, so we'll look at that. So I'll do the sum, square bracket, P of S times this thing. So that's going to give me X of S squared times P of S. So that's my first sum. Minus, pull my constants out of my sum, 2 times mu times, now my sum, let me lower this, I realize how much up I'm going to do. Am I going to lose you if I split this into sums at the same time I factor out the P of S? No. no. Yeah? No? no? Okay. I sure hope not. I sure hope not, too. So, the first term. So, the first term is x of s squared, multiply the p of s to it. So we have x of s squared times p of s. Right? Mm -hmm. so that's this one. Maybe I won't factor anything out of my sums. I'll just write my separate sums, and then I think you'll see it all. Plus, my next sum will do negative 2 times mu times x of s times p of s. That's distributing the p of s to this term, and then just trying to get it as a separate sum. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now this one, plus the sum of mu squared times p of s. Good? Yes. Okay. So this is equal to x of s squared times the probability of s, that's the, exa the exact same thing as the expected value of x squared. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Notice if you were to write this out, you'd write exactly that thing right there. Yeah. Okay, plus, I'm going to factor out my negative 2 and my u from this whole sum, because they're just constants. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll, we'll just leave it at that for now, and then come back and mess with it. So factor out 2 mu from that, and we're left with times the sum of x of s times p of s. Oh, wow, that looks familiar. Weird. So weird. Plus, and maybe... The expected I'll value of m squared. Keep that one out, and we'll let you think about this as well. What about the squared? Thank you. Okay, this one we're already done with, so we'll just rewrite that term down here. Okay, what is this sum? The expected value of x. The expected value of x, or mu, right? Yeah. So I have negative 2 times mu times mu, or negative 2 mu squared. Everyone follow that? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so now, look at this one. What's the sum of all my probabilities? 1. 1! One. So then we have plus mu squared. Follow well, that? Yeah, so this is equal to the expected value of x squared minus, we have 2 mu squared plus mu squared leaves me what? Mu squared. Minus mu squared. Minus mu squared, right? You follow the algebra on that? Huh? I have negative 2 of these, and I have positive 1 of these. How many total do I have? Negative 1. Negative 1 of them. Okay. Right? But what is mu? By definition, it's so this is equal to e of x squared minus e of x squared. I just did it in brackets, so I make it clear to you that the square is there. This is how you'll see it in the book. Wait, so it goes nothing? No, these are not the same numbers. Those are two oh. very, very different numbers. <laughs> So are we going to do an example with this uh, Yeah, so now we're going to redo calculating the variance up here. Think about it this way. Okay. Okay. So, we just need to find the expected value of x squared. The expected value of x squared is 1 squared times 1 six plus 2 squared times 1 six plus 3 squared times 1 six, 
plus 4 squared times 1 6 plus 5 squared times 1 6 plus 6 squared times 1 6. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that is 1 plus 4 is 5. 5 plus 9 is 14. 14 plus 16 is 30. 30 plus 25 is 55. And 55 plus 36 is 91 over 6. Right? Yeah. And what was the expected value of x? 3.5. 3.5 or 7 halves. So our variance then, our variance of x is equal to the expected value of x squared, which is 91 6, minus the expected value of x all squared, or 3.5 squared, or 7 halves squared, or 49 fourths. Right? And then someone on their calculator want to do that real quick? Divided by 6 minus 49 divided by 4. It's what? 2.916666. Two point, oh, 2.92. Let's see. 2 Let's see. Quick way to check this. Times it by 12 when we get 35. And we do. Okay, so yeah, we get 35 twelves. Oh. oh. <laughs> yes. Make sense? The second way is a lot more simpler. Yeah. But you can't appreciate the second way until you see the mess that the first way makes. Yeah. Alright, that's it. So, test next week.